Welcome back. It's time to grab your board, swim out into the sea of ideas, and let's see if we can catch that sales pipeline as it's starting to curl up out of the horizon there. With our host, the host who knows the most, I think it's Matt Hines. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. Very excited to have everyone here. We are here every week at 11.30 Pacific, 2.30 Eastern. Those of you joining us on the live or funnel media radio network, thank you very much for joining us. I'm always impressed and humbled by how many people are joining us via live radio in the middle of their work day, so thank you for that. For those of you just joining us on the podcast, listening to this on demand, thank you very much for subscribing and for listening, and everybody can listen to every episode of Sales Pipeline Radio past, present, and future at salespipelineradio.com. We are featuring every week on the show some of the best and brightest minds in B2B sales and marketing. Today is no different. Very, very excited to have a good friend, known him for a long time here in Seattle, Norm B- Norman Bihar. He is the founder and Managing Director of Sales Readiness Group. And as we were setting up for this show today, and Norman was very clear he wanted to focus on content, focus on best practices, and we're going to do plenty of that. For those of you who don't know Norman and Sales Readiness Group, they've been around for a long time. They've been recognized as one of the top 20 sales training companies in the country by Selling Power Magazine, and featured as a sales training company to watch, list by trainingindustry.com. Lots of uh, accolades for the team, and I know he's a, he's a humble guy and doesn't want to get into that, but Norman, thank you so much. I know you're a busy guy. Thank you for taking time to join us on the Sales Pipeline Radio today. Matt, always a pleasure. Really looking forward to chatting with you and sharing some new insights that we've uh, gathered regarding sales and sales management training. So thank you for having me on the show today. Speaking of new insights, if you're not familiar with Norman's work and his team's work, definitely go to salesreadinessgroup.com. Lots of great content reports, best practice guides. And you guys just released a new report that I'm actually pretty excited about that isn't just big training best practices, but really showcases salespeople's perspective on the impact sales training can have. Can you talk a little bit about that new report? Yeah, it's something we did in collaboration with trainingindustry.com. One of the questions that often comes up from sales leaders is, okay, so we've done sales training in the past, but, you know, sometimes it's been effective, sometimes it has a lasting effect, but in many cases it doesn't necessarily have a lasting effect. And so we wanted to better understand, you know, what's really important to salespeople and what's the business impact associated with sales training. And we know that companies are investing more than ever in sales training. There was a uh, stat by uh, training industry showing that sales training now is estimated at a $2.5 billion uh, market globally, and it's grown by $1 billion over the last seven years. You've kind of got these mixed signals coming up. Sales leaders who are saying, you know, is there really a um, strong correlation between great sales training and business results? You know, at the same time, you have this huge increase in spending. So obviously, we think companies are pretty smart. They wouldn't be spending more if it wasn't impacting their business. But we wanted to really get the sales reps perspective and understand what is it you know, that makes for a great training program? How does it actually impact uh, business? And we had some pretty interesting results, Matt. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, we, we talked a lot about the things you saw in terms of the skills that separate sort of the, the best in class companies from those that are a bit of the laggards. Um, so, you know, the employee satisfaction with different types of research. What's some of the highlights of what you guys found? One of the things that wasn't surprising, but stood out, was really one of the most important skills, and I think we had them um, as part of the survey rank like nine skills. We had about a little, I think around 250 respondents. So we think we got a really good cross section, different industries, different company sizes, predominantly B2B uh, sales professionals. Three key skills were building relationships. So obviously, salespeople need to build rapport, identifying customer needs, great questioning skills, great active listening skills to really understand what customers need, and being able to present value and really differentiate what you're presenting and aligning it with the customer's needs. But what was interesting for that is we hear a lot about potential changes in the sales profession, and you and I are both involved with sales professionals. Daily, we know that many things are changing. There's more sales enablement technology than ever before. When we asked what skills are likely to be the most important skills 10 years from now, it was exactly these three skills that still came up at the top of the listing, which was, you know, again, building relationships, identifying the customer needs, and, and presenting value. So that was kind of interesting in terms of companies that did a better job on skills training at three areas of the business that were impacted. One was the ramp-up time for new hires, win rates, and employee satisfaction, and we get, we gathered some really interesting data on, on each of those areas. Now, it's interesting that you found that, you know, some of these skills, you know, really haven't changed a lot. I find that a little interesting because there's been so much talk about, well, sales 2.0 time now, and the buyer has changed, and that means we've got to change the way we sell, and then, 
you know, what was sales 2.0 is now being thought of, you know, being called by some conferences as sales 3.0, and it just continues to accelerate. But what you're seeing is that there are some fundamentals to sales training and sales skills that really haven't changed. I think that's really interesting. You know, is, is, and I'm curious as you see more complex sales organizations, whether they're just larger, whether they're multi-location, whether you've got multi-generational sales teams, does that mix of skills change at all, or does that stay fairly constant? I think the actual skills, and we're a little biased, we're a skills training company. The research shows is that the, the skills that sales professional needs are really not changing. That's the same whether they're veteran salespeople, millennials. I do think the way that we engage with customers have changed. So even though the skill may not have changed, the, the nature of how we engage, in other words, if we look at just the rate of growth of inside sales teams versus uh, direct sales teams, it's much faster for inbound teams. If we look at the technology industry and we look at the degree of specialization, we've got business development representatives, we have account executives, we have account managers. So there's probably a growing trend to less full-cycle salespeople that are actually going all the way from prospecting to closing. There are true changes that probably give rise to sales.2.0, 3.0 in terms of sales enablement technologies, specialization, tools, um, also the marketing tools, which uh, you know you have a lot of expertise in those related to lead generation. But the actual skill sets, I think, are pretty uh, much the same. Although, as you have more specialization, some skills will apply more to some positions than others. For example, an account manager who's managing his existing accounts may only need some very light prospecting skills to navigate within those accounts. Someone who's fully charged only with new business development may need a lot of prospecting skills. So we, we are seeing subtle changes based on sales roles, but the actual foundational skills, particularly around identifying needs, presenting value, and managing objections are very much the same. Talking on Sales Pipeline Radio today with Norman Bihar. He's the founder and managing director of the Sales Readiness Group. And, Norman, I want to take a quick step back and, and, and just talk about the prioritization of sales training with some organizations in general. Because, I mean, from what I see, and you see this all the time, but even from what I see often from the marketing perspective, there's a fairly uh, inconsistent and uneven application of sales training. Some organizations treat it as an ongoing core competency, something they have to do on an ongoing basis. Others, it's something they may do during SKO, they may do every once in a while, and don't really make a regular part of their practice. What do you guys see in the field today, and what is best practice for how sales training works in the market? Well, I think one of the things we see is that the term sales training means different things to different companies. So there's a little bit of a definition there's onboarding of new hires, and that can even be a sales boot camp. A lot of those are now being run virtually. You don't necessarily have to pull everyone together. And when you think about just kind of ramping up a new sales team, it's not just about training on sales skills, but you also want to review what's the sales strategy, who are the target industries, what's our key messaging, how do we generate and distribute leads, what's our sales process, what kind of sales tools and, and enablement technologies do you use. So, there are many things that are just foundational that need to happen when people enter a new company or a new sales organization, really around sales readiness. And then there's what I would call industry and product training. If you're introducing new products or new offerings, there's training associated with those. A lot of that is done through product marketing. But even within product marketing, we're seeing not just, you know, what are the features and benefits, but what problems do these products or solutions solve for customers? And then there's the skills training piece. What we're seeing in the best practice is that that should no longer be limited to events. We still get calls. This time of year, our phone is really flooded, and maybe I better better said our inbox is flooded. Companies that are running either year-end events or kickoff events and want to bring in a sales training company, like any other sales training company, we're happy to do that, but we, we don't think the event itself is effective. We really want to see ongoing training and reinforcement. So... Because of the technologies that are out there today, there's a lot we can do to really set up a great training program with intake interviews, customization. We can also use blended learning so the training doesn't look like you're drinking from a fire hose just over a couple of days, but really spread out and spaced out over a much longer period of time. And then phenomenal ways to uh, reinforce and coach that training. Lots of great coaching programs, coaching tools using on-demand video, using virtual classrooms. With today's technologies, without having to have the expense of necessarily flying everyone in for an event with a airfare and accommodations, 
there are many ways to space out and make the program ongoing. Another uh, trend that we're seeing and we really like is what we call small group cohorts, where there may be a cohort of eight to ten salespeople that are gathering weekly or every other week and kind of discussing best practices. Usually it's a facilitated session. And this form of informal learning uh, really allows for a lot of sharing of, of very practical real-world insights. A couple more minutes before we've got to take a break here with Norm Bihar, the uh, managing director and founder of the Sales Readiness Group. And you know, talk a little bit real quick before we got to go around the idea of you got training and then you've got reinforcement. And I think a lot of companies will do a training, whether it's virtual training or online training or in-person training. Um, and even if they're doing it on a regular basis, they'll train on something and they kind of move on. How do you guys think about the combination or maybe the integration of the training itself as well as sort of the reinforcement and follow-up of that training? Is it part, is it all the same thing or like how do, comp- how do the best companies do that? Ideally, it should be part of the same thing, but it is compartmentalized. So as, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you really want to set up the training for success. I understand the company's culture, the business objectives. One of the questions I often ask is, let's say you're making a decision on a training program and you're looking at different companies. One of the things I would want to ask is, what will the sales team do differently or or better six months from now from what they're doing today? What we really want to focus on is behavior change. And then you actually have the training. So we think about it kind of as learn, apply, and adopt. And in actual training, most of the focus is on learning, and applying. So basically, you're going to learn some new concepts, you're going to discuss the concepts, you go through the exercises, and then maybe apply them in the form of case studies. We think about reinforcement, the learning is really toned down. We're just kind of reviewing a few of the key concepts, and then we're really focusing on real-world application. So the reinforcement and the coaching that follows training should always be around real-world application, and ideally because it becomes part of a process that you're going through, that application on an ongoing basis leads to ongoing adoption. So we think about the training as kind of learn and apply, and we think about the reinforcement as apply and adopt. We're going to take a quick break, pay some bills here. We're back with more with Norm Bihar, the founder and managing director of the Sales Readiness Group. We're going to talk a little bit about how you measure the impact and the ROI of sales training, who orders and manages sales training in the organization, and much more. We'll be right back on this episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. In a world where the speed of innovation and change in B2B marketing has never been greater, the only thing bigger is the need for clarity, for a blueprint, for a guide to what's really working. And how about a way to apply it specifically today to increase sales pipeline growth, velocity, and most of all, conversion? That's what you'll find in the Modern Marketer's Field Guide. And amazingly, you can download it for free. HeinzMarketing.com, just like it sounds, H-E-I-N-Z-M-A-R-K-E-T-I-N-G. It encompasses the entire sales and marketing cycle, but in quick bursts with lots of specific, actionable ideas, strategies, tactics you can put to work right away, like today. The loaded table of contents helps you narrow in and tackle a problem, and it's something you can come back to over and over again as a reference guide. Why not download your free copy of the Modern Marketer's Field Guide? It's free. HeinzMarketing.com, just like it sounds. H-E-I-N-Z, marketing.com. All right. With that being said, let's pick it back up with Matt in the second half of uh, today's show. Well, thank you very much. Welcome back to Sales Pipeline Radio. If you like what you're hearing today with our guest, Norman B. Hart from Sales Readiness Group, you can find this episode on demand in just a couple days at salespipelineradio.com. And make sure you join us next week and every week. It'll be 1130 Pacific, 2.30 Eastern for future episodes of Sales Pipeline Radio. We've got some great guests coming up. We've got Eli Cohen. He's the co-founder of Sales Hood. He's doing some great work in the sales enablement space. He's written a new book that I'm really excited about around sales enablement and process improvement. The sales organization, and he's got a great platform. His company produces the sales, and we're going to talk about that. Lots of other great uh, episodes coming up, some great guests as we head quickly into the fall season as we uh, round out the end of Q3. But we got a few more minutes here with Norman B. Harmon. Norman, we were, we were talking over the break about sort of the impact we're seeing sales training have, and in particular, I want to go back and talk a little more about specific things that we're seeing, and I think it ties back to my question that I was going to ask around how you measure the impact of sales training, and you've seen specifically things like win rates and employee satisfaction 
stand out as real differentiators for companies that are investing in sales training. Can you talk a little more about that? Yeah, if we go back to the uh, the study we just completed, you know, we think about those companies that necessarily had effective training programs, you know, at least ranked by their, you know, rated by their sales professionals as being effective versus less effective. The results were pretty striking. And when I say results, obviously, this is based on correlation, but, but here's what we learned. That the ramp-up time for new hires, on average, when there was effective training, was 26 weeks, so roughly half a year to ramp up. And when the training wasn't effective, you know, that's it took 31 weeks. So we think about five more weeks of sales rep productivity. That could be, you know, if a salesperson has uh, a million-dollar annual quota, let's say they're only 50% ramped up as opposed to fully wet, ramped up, that could be close to forty-five, forty-six thousand dollars $46,000 a week of lost revenue over those five weeks. So pretty significant implications at the single rep level. And obviously, if you have a team of reps that, you know, you've hired that are all kind of ramping up together, you really want to accelerate that ramp-up time. Other areas besides training that impact ramp-up time, obviously, are hiring the right people, making sure that you're really doing a great job of managing performance and coaching and mentoring those those new hires. Another area we saw was win rates. So companies are often, you know, entering opportunities into their sales pipeline, you know, whatever type of um, CRM tool they're using. And when the companies had effective training, they had a 51% win rate on those opportunities. In effective training, those companies had a 41% uh, win rate. So win rates are 24% better when you have more effective training. And if you think about that on a million-dollar year quota, that means you need 24% more opportunities in order to achieve your to achieve your sales quota. And if you think about the type of um, things that companies can do to improve win rates. It really comes down to skills coaching. The salespeople have the right skills. And another area that's often overlooked uh, but really important, Matt, is opportunity coaching. Is the manager actually working with them in a pipeline review and asking the right questions, really making sure they help the salesperson advance opportunities through the pipeline. And that's an area we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how does a manager work with a sales professional to advance opportunities through the pipeline. I mean, some of the stats you just gave in terms of the the, the, the gap that you're seeing, I mean, the win rate and employee satisfaction, I mean, that's some pretty good stuff. And I think for a lot of companies that, you know, in many cases see a, a deeper investment in sales training is a, a nice to have, not a need to have. It seems like you just laid out the justification for that. Before we get too far into this, I want to make sure you, we, we let people know, where can people get a copy of this research you guys just did? So I think the best way to go is to go to uh, salesreadinessgroup.com and go to our website, go to the resources section, and you'll see a whole section on uh, white papers and reports. We also did uh, one that we released uh, last year on the five hallmarks of high-impact sales organizations and what those sales managers are doing differently and better. We have a great white paper on accelerating the sales higher ramp-up time, so what actually can companies do to accelerate ramp-up time so a lot of resources. I'd also encourage them to sign up for our blog. Uh, we blog oftenly about a lot of topics that are interesting to sales professionals and sales leaders. So, again, salesreadinessgroup.com, resources, and then go to white papers and reports. And you can download any of this information. And also, if you'd like, subscribe to our blog. Yeah, I, w- I would double down on that. And I think uh, you know, there's a lot of vendors that we see that have a lot of content that ends up being kind of thinly veiled sales pitches, and I think you guys stand out for me at least as far as the the comprehensiveness and generosity of the content you give that really sort of think ends up driving more business your way because people clearly see that you know what you're talking about. Uh, I'm curious if you've seen over the years a, a difference in who's ordering sales training, like who are some of your customers and, the, and how should companies that maybe have underinvested in training in the past, how should they structure themselves internally to have resources dedicated to at least helping to manage a research, a training program, even if they're bringing organizations like your, like yours in with the subject matter expertise and the content to execute. So I think that what we really need to look at is sales leadership. And if we look at kind of your VP, C-level suite around sales leadership, maybe chief sales officer, really more engagement. I think a lot of companies are delegating um, – sales training to training and development professionals, and they really understand best practices related to approach. And when we talk to them, they kind of understand that why a sales training program has to have a beginning, middle, and, you know, ongoing reinforcement, so kind of before, during, and after. But when we start to engage with them about actual, you know, customer interaction and what is it that the salespeople are doing well and what needs to change, 
that's where we really want to get engagement from the senior sales leaders and ideally the frontline managers. The other area I would encourage is companies do have limited budgets, and if they're going to focus on any one area, I would focus first on the frontline managers. I think that when salespeople work with a great frontline manager who's a coach and can also work as a kind of on-the-job trainer and provide a lot of uh, experience and insights, those managers who are good leaders, good coaches, and good managers can have probably more impact than actually a formal training program. It also allows this training to cascade down through the organization. You have managers who are now basically evangelists for the training and helping improve that skill set. So I'd say more engagement at the senior um, sales leader level, more engagement by the frontline managers, and then really focus on skills training. Skills are the differentiator. People move from position to position, but those people can have great customer conversations are those people ultimately will best understand their customers' needs and close the most business. Norman, you guys focus a lot on sales management training, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective. I, I hear the word you know, sales manager and sales coach used synonymously as if they're the same thing. How do, how do you think about the differentiation between someone that is a sales manager and a sales coach, and how do some sales leaders effectively do both? So generally, we think of the sales manager as frontline manager, let's say a regional manager or district manager, or even an inside sales manager that has a team of salespeople. And those managers have a number of responsibilities. Their job to build a team, so typically they're, if not involved in recruiting, minimally they're involved in interviewing. They need to be able to manage sales performance to set sales goals, set sales activity goals, monitor performance. They need to be able to manage their team. They need to be able to lead their team, and they need to be able to coach their team. So we think about management, sales management. I like to think of hire, manage, coach, and lead. And mm-hmm. I would say of those four skills, coaching is probably the most important one. So sales coaching is really one of the four primary management responsibilities, the others, again, being hiring, managing performance, and leading. I like that answer, and I, I, you know, I think uh, for those of you that are listening live as well as those that may be uh, listening to this uh, on demand over the next couple of weeks after we record this, um, definitely check out, if you go to the salesreadinessgroup.com and scroll to the bottom of the page, uh, amongst all that great content, there is a uh, live webinar coming up on August 30th titled Transforming Sales Managers into World-Class Coaches. So I'd encourage you to check out knowing, knowing Norman and his team. I'm sure that will be available on demand on the site afterward as well, but make sure you take advantage of that. Norman, as we wrap up, you know, you've spent an awful lot of time, you know, leading sales organizations, training, I don't know, countless sales managers, sales, sales, sales people, sales professionals. Who are some of the people that have most influenced you or your career? You know, they can be professors, they can be authors, they can be alive or dead. But, you know, are there a couple of people that stand out that have been particularly influential to you that you might recommend other people check out as well? I think you know this, but I, I'm a sports addict, and one of the people that I think is really phenomenal in terms of getting the most out of their players is a great all-time basketball coach called Phil Jackson. And what I think is interesting about Phil Jackson is I think he played, don't hold me to a number, but I think like around 13 NBA seasons. Matt, how many times do you think he made the all-star team? Um, the way you set that up, I'm guessing zero. Zero. But <laughs> how about in terms of winning record, I think he might have one of the highest winning percentages of all time. And I think his team's won more championships than any other team. So I look at that and I say, okay, what we really need to do is it's all about empowering other people. The other thing I look at is great leaders generally. And the great leaders are not necessarily these wonderful, charismatic people who make all these great claims. It's okay if they can back up the claims, but quite often it's people who are leading through example. And when if I ever think about sales managers, the ones that have earned my most respect are the people who are really in there with the sales team, leading by example, coaching and asking questions, and the people who are probably doing the, the worst job are the people who are telling people how they used to do it. It's ineffective, and it doesn't have a lasting impact. Again, lots of great insights today. We've covered a lot of ground. I want to thank our guest again, Norma Bihar. He's the founder and managing director of the Sales Readiness Group. Definitely check out their website for not only a copy of the new research report, the salesperson's perspective on the impact of sales training, but all the great other content, webinars, upcoming classes. They've got lots of great stuff. Again, if you'd like to get a replay of this episode, you can find it in a couple of days on salespipelineradio.com. We'll have it up there with some of the notes from this session as well. We will have a transcripted, highlighted version of this conversation up on our blog at heinzmarketing.com. And make sure you join us next week and every week 
for future episodes of Sales Pipeline Radio. For my great producer, Paul, this is Matt Hines. Thanks again for joining us on another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio. You've been listening to another episode of Sales Pipeline Radio, brought to you by the good folks at Matt Hines Marketing, right here on the Funnel Radio Network, for at-work listeners like you.